part of the church of Jesus Christ is sometimes scary, but it's exciting and scary in, in sometimes that we, we're not really sure what we should do. But this morning I want to encourage you from God's Word to find out that you can actually grow in your understanding and your relationship with God um, and being plugged into God's Word. That's how we do it. And that's what I want to talk to you this morning about. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, please, verses 1 through 15. We're not going to read the entire passage. We will be referring back to it. Um, but as we go through it, you'll catch the drift. Or maybe as I'm preaching and you, and you feel like there's a little gap there, just quickly read or read it when you get home, preferably, that you know exactly where we're at. So as we're talking about that this morning, obviously through the picture up on the screen, you're going to realize that we're talking about the very Word of God. That book that you're holding in front of me or the Bible that's on your phone or your tablet, whatever however means you are using this morning. But the powerful Word of God is the thing that transforms our life. And in the world we find ourselves living in a world that is full of skepticism and we find that people are almost anti the supernatural anti the things of god but in christianity we realize that we serve a god the god of the supernatural the god who breathes life into the very word of god and that transforms our lives christianity is the only faith that offers hope for humanity that offers hope in the world that you and i live in there is a god and who he is the creator of the universe, the God that you and I can encounter in a very personal way through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only does he exist, but he is knowable. He is knowable. In other words, you can encounter him and you can know him in a very personal way. He's revealed himself to mankind through the person of Jesus Christ. He is real. People have encountered him. People have written about him. God created us to know him. In John chapter 17, verse 3, a Bible, John was writing, Now this is eternal life, that they, may, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that we may know God, and that we may know Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. This is eternal life. It's only as we know God that we experience and can and inherit eternal life. It's not that we know about God, but the Bible says that we know Him and that we know Jesus Christ. For a person to know someone, you have to encounter that person. You have to be in a relationship with that person. For Christ followers, the highest level of spiritual maturity is knowing God. We cannot be, go beyond and grow in our faith with the Lord Jesus Christ unless we encounter God. And the only way to fully know God is by knowing His Word. That is, knowing the Bible. And so we, God has given us this lovely love letter that you and I can read and spend time in. And so the, unfortunately, so many believers never spend time in God's Word. The Apostle Paul knew that when he wrote to the church in Philippi, he knew without a shadow of a doubt about the Word of God. He says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance. Paul knew that he could find contentment in the Word of God. Folks, it's, uh, it's important that you and I come to that place of understanding and knowing the Word of God deep down in our heart. That's the place where we find contentment. Without the Word of God, we're going to run here and there, we're going to do all sorts of crazy things, and we have to come to that place of contentment. Are you satisfied in your faith today? Are you walking by faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Philippians, I'm not saying this because I am in need. I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content. How did he learn to be content? Through his knowledge of Scripture. When are we in the Word of God? Are we only in the Word of God on a Sunday morning or if we hear a message on the TV or on the radio? But where are we spending time in God's Word? Is it only the little devotional that we may read? And maybe then we don't even read that. You see, all of mankind, you and I, but all of us together, will find ourselves facing crises in our life and different difficult circumstances. And if not today, it'll be sometime during the course of life. You will face it. But how do you deal with it unless you are in the Word of God? It's only the people who really know God that will display strength that will be able to overcome difficult circumstances and adverse circumstances in their lives as they are in the Word of God. Because in the Word of God, we find ourselves how in, in difficult circumstances and we find instruction on how to overcome. No one can ever influence the world 
if they lack courage. If we just check in, if we're so timid in our faith, how can we think that we can influence the world? I love the fact that these missionaries, Paul, Silas, and Peter, and Luke, that these guys were, were men of faith and that they were courageous in their walk, that they went forth and they spoke the word of God boldly without any, without any shame. The apostle Paul reminded Timothy of this when he said, for the, spirit, for, <clears throat> for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. This is what the Spirit of God does. But He does it through the Word of God. Jesus said, you don't have to worry about if they arrest you or put you out. Or whatever. You don't even have to worry about that because the Holy Spirit will remind you and bring to remembrance everything that I've told you. If you're not in the Word of God, what can He bring to remembrance? We have to be in the Word of God that the Spirit of God then can take that which we've read and bring it to our remembrance. Having courage in bold and boldness is essential in telling people about Jesus. Is essential if, if to impact the world. If we're not in the Word of God, how can we then impact the world? We have to be in the Word of God. The Apostle Paul and his friends certainly had courage and boldness when they went into all these different areas of Asia Minor. They faced trials, they faced persecution, but it didn't deter Paul from carrying out the mission. When you face opposition and you face difficulty in your life, is it a deterrent in sharing your faith? Do you say, well, what's it all about? Even that people don't respond to you or they, or they mock you or they ridicule you? Do, you? do you then just throw in the town and say, and just give up? I hope not, because certainly if we look at the Word of God and we see the example that we find in God's Word from the Apostle Paul, from Peter, from Silas, and, and, and from Luke, these men were courageous in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, even though they faced tremendous opposition. Remember in Acts chapter 16, there was Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They had left, left Philippi in the wake of tremendous opposition, and, they were, and they, the people were really riled up because of Paul's preaching. And so they decided to get rid of Paul. Remember, he'd set that woman that was demonically possessed, and she was even saying the things after Paul and saying and confessing truth, but she was, she was working for the enemy. And when they had left Philippi, they, they went southwest, and they traveled down to Thessalonica. And Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia, about 200,000 people in Thessalonica. But they didn't hang out there. But, but as was Common, Paul went straight to the synagogue, he started preaching, and, and again, what happened? He faced tremendous opposition from the Jewish people that were there. They didn't want to hear that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't want to know about being saved. But yet, in the passage, when you read in, in Acts chapter 17, you will find that there were some that did believe. And there were some Greeks that came to believe. Men and women, and they, they came to believe. But again, as was custom, they wanted to drive Paul out. And they did, they drove him out. But Paul never lost his passion in spreading the gospel, even though he was rejected, even though they wanted to get rid of him. Again, he and Silas faced severe opposition from, the country, from his own countrymen. Isn't it amazing that, that sometimes you want to share the gospel from those that are closest to you, and they're the ones that give you the hardest time? But it didn't deter them. They were passionate about their relationship. And so they fled, and they went down to Berea, just a couple of miles further on. And they started teaching again in the synagogue. Now, Berea wasn't a huge city. It wasn't as big as Thessalonica. And in fact, it was, in today's terms, just a little, little city, a little town that wasn't really of great importance. But Paul, because of his love for his people, he couldn't contain himself. And he went straight to the synagogue and started preaching. And again, and he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, he says, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He, he knew that this was God's call on his life, and he had to tell people about Jesus. He, he was compelled, and he said, Woe is me if I don't, if I don't fulfill God's call on my life. And so he had to, even though he would face opposition, even though he would face difficulty in his life, Paul had tremendous courage when he preached the gospel. Even so much that when he was incarcerated and then was set free, he went back and did the same thing over and over again. It's like, Paul, don't you get it? People don't want to hear this message. But he said, but there might be one or two, or there might be two or three that will find Jesus. 
He wasn't concerned about the possible trials that he would face in Berea when he left Thessalonica. He wasn't concerned about that. And perhaps he remembered the Lord's words in Matthew chapter 6 when Jesus said, Don't worry, don't, don't fear, don't be anxious. Or, Luke's wor- or, or the words of Luke in Luke chapter 12. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this, this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? You see, he wasn't concerned about that. All he was worried, he he wasn't worried. He just went forth and shared the word of God without concern. If they put me in jail, so what? If I was shipwrecked, so what? I still went forth and told the gospel. If people mock you and ridicule you, even laugh at you, continue sharing the gospel. It doesn't matter because great is your reward. In the Bible, Jesus was, and we read in the scriptures that if we deny Jesus before men, the Father will deny us. Wow, how can we deny so great a salvation? His courage in sharing Jesus and the message of salvation was built on faith. It was built in his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was plugged into the very power of the Lord. He trusted in God. Are you and I plugged in? Are you and I plugged in to the power of God? How do we know God's will? Are we plugged into the Word of God? Because we find that our relationship is being established and we grow through our knowledge and our understanding of God's Word. He could truly echo the words of David, who also knew what it was like to be in trouble and to be harassed and to be pursued. The psalmist said over here in in Psalm 27, verse 1 and 3, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear, David said. The Lord is my stronghold and my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He he confessed this. The Lord is my strength. And he continued, he said, And when the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. He trusted God wholeheartedly. He knew his relationship with God and he never feared. And though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. No matter what happens in life, we can have confidence because we know God and we have a living relationship with Him. And folks, it's time that you and I got up and trusted God, regardless of who we tell, even if they reject us. Obviously, you need to be praying about it. You need to be in a relationship because you also don't want to cast your pearls before the pigs. And so you ask God, Lord, show me and give me wisdom on how to do it. And so we go and tell people. Paul echoed these thoughts when he wrote in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. How do we be strong in the Lord? As if we're in the Word of God, we trust in God, we have faith in God, and we're in a living relationship with God. You see, the key to having courage is trusting in the power and the care of God and depending upon His strength. That it's not in my strength, Lord. I can't do this in my strength. Anyone who wants to go into the ministry or serve the Lord wholeheartedly must have their head examined unless God's call is on their life. I'm serious. Ask Pastor Joe, ask Pastor Joshua. It's a call. And you've got to fulfill that in your life. And in any kind of circumstance of life, Christians can be confident that the Lord preserves the faithful. Now, just because you're not preaching this morning or because you're not called into the full-time ministry as a teacher or as a pastor doesn't mean to say you're off the hook. You're not. The moment you signed up to serve Jesus, you signed up in His army. And you are then called to serve God in His army, to be faithful. Lacking courage comes from an inadequate understanding of God. How do we get to understand God? Is if we're in His Word. You will never understand the nature and the character of God unless you spend time in the living Word of God. And so again, I encourage you, get back in the Word of God if you haven't been there for a while. The second aspect is that we must live our lives in purity before God. Are we living our lives such as God is pleased with? Or are we fooling around with things that we shouldn't be touching or being, or being involved in? God calls us to live lives of purity, lives of holiness. That's when God can use us. That's when we have an understanding with God. And that's what David knew. David knew that. And on, the, on this basis, David declared that he could trust God because he had no unconfessed sin in his life. I always love to tell people, keep a short record. When the Spirit of God reveals something that, 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 that is a hindrance in your relationship with Jesus Christ, quickly come to God 
Say, Lord, I really messed up over here. Lord, would you forgive me of my sin? And confess it to him and turn away from that sin and then walk in the path that Christ calls you to. On the basis God delivered him. If we attempt to fight our spiritual battles in our own strength, with huge holes in our breastplate of righteousness, the enemy will shoot his fiery darts and they'll find those holes and they'll take you out. You see, the, ble- the breastplate of righteousness is that we do the right thing, is that we live a right life, that we are righteous. And our righteousness is not of ourselves, it is of God. It's Christ's righteousness that we place on ourselves. The third way of having courage this morning is by having hope. And our hope in Jesus never, ever disappoints us. He never, ever will let you down. Never. He, that's the kind of Lord that He is. He's always there beside you. It comes by us thanking God in advance for our victories. If we're walking in in that relationship, we're walking in holiness, we're walking with purity and in righteousness with the Lord. When we pray, we know God hears our prayer because there's no hindrance, there's no barrier between Him and us. And so we can pray with confidence and we have hope that we will have a victory. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we read that when Jehoshaphat was king, we, he came and he knew that Judah was powerless against her enemies. The Moabites and the Ammonites, they were coming and they were going to attack Israel during that time. But he trusted God and he led his people out to meet the enemy. He had hope in God and he appointed those to sing to the Lord and those who praise him. He said, go before and we will thank God already for the victory that he's going to give into our lives. God was number one. I have the passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, whether, and, and look what the, the writer says. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. What were they thanking God for? Thanking God for His goodness and His mercy. Thanking God for the victory that they were about to have. And as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab at Mount Seir, and they were as who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Is because they went forth praising God, thanking God for the victory, because they were in a right standing with God. Imagine if they were messing up, and if they were worshiping all the idols and doing all the other stuff, and if they would say, "Okay, God, would you help us along here?" God would say, "Uh, uh-uh. uh." We have to be in that living relationship. And we find that as we trust God, as we trust in His Word, not only must we have courage as believers, we must have the strength and the power, and we must also understand the Word of God. In other words, how to apply the Word of God in every circumstance of our lives. Not only must we have the right message, we must have the boldness to proclaim the correct message. What does the Bible say? And that's what is the important thing. The message is found within the pages of Scripture. This is the message that you and I are called to share. The Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is therefore powerful and effective. It is is God-breathed. Look what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Is the Word of God powerful? I'd say. Look how powerful. That it even separates the joints and even the marrow. It goes down to the very structure of our humanness. He reveals Himself. And it judges the thoughts and the intents. In other words, our thought life and that which motivates us. The Word of God. It searches out our hearts. And folks, when you read the Word of God, ask God to speak to you through His Word. And if you really mean business with Jesus, He will speak to you. He'll reveal Himself to you powerfully and mightily. Some Christians believe that it is of utmost importance not to offend anyone. And they, you know, these are wonderful Christians that believe that. And some of these well-meaning believers will only tell non-believers on what, what Jesus has to offer them to improve their lives and how they can spend eternity in heaven. Now, is that the full gospel? Is that the whole message that the Bible says? Many shy away from telling unbelievers the truth that their sinful life is an offense to the holy God. We don't want to tell people that they are sinners and that they, that, that they need to repent 
of their sin and turn to God and surrender their lives in holiness before God. You see, when we only come and we only water down the gospel and say, just accept Jesus and you got your ticket to heaven and you're on your way without any repentance. You see, you can't be saved unless you repent. There has to be a turning away from sin and a, and a focusing and, and turning toward God. There has to be a 180 degree turn when you are walking one way in sin and you confront the cross of Jesus. What do you do with Him? You have to turn and say, Lord, forgive me and I walk in the way that you call me to live. You cannot continue in the way that we live without, without confession. There has to be repentance. And if we're telling people, just pray this little prayer and you end, without any repentance, I question the salvation and the motive of a person's heart. You see, Jesus never messed, and never, never said, listen, just go and, 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 and everything's going to be fine. He said to the woman who was caught in, in adultery, he said, go and sin no more. There has to be a way of turning away from sin. There can never be true salvation unless a person repents of sin. You see, and if we fail to present the necessity of repentance, we present an unbalanced gospel presentation and the approach to evangelism. That, that pe and, and oftentimes then when things go wrong and people have prayed that prayer and the wheels fall off, they question why. But if you've really come to Jesus and you've given your heart and you've confessed your sin and you've said, Jesus, save me, I'm a sinner, I cannot save myself. When we come to that realization and we mess up, then we know, Jesus, I know I don't have it together. And you can come and just lift me up again. That's the kind of God we serve. It's a God of a second chance. And he's always there to bring us back. Paul, in writing to the Romans, declared this confidently when he said, As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Jesus is an offense to people. Here's what Jesus says. And our lives must match up to what Christ says. We don't bring, down, we don't bring Jesus down to match our lives. We lift our lives that we can be the followers that Christ calls us to. We need to lift our lives up. And we can only do that as we're in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit shows us and encourages us and gives us the ability to do that. Paul boldly reasoned with the Jews in Thessalonica. On three Sabbaths, three, three separate Sabbaths, he came and he told them, and yet they didn't believe. Paul used the same approach when he came to Berea and he spoke to the Jews, to his countrymen over there about Jesus. And it was clear that they didn't have the same prejudices as did the Thessalonians. And we see this that they came, the Jews in Berea came and they, and, 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 they, and they listened intently to what Paul was saying. The Bible says that they went back and they searched the Scriptures to see if these things were so. They reasoned and they, they didn't just write Paul off. I mean, Paul was educated. He knew the Word of God. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. And yet, some accepted and some rejected. Then when the guys back in Thessalonica heard that Paul and his entourage and his missionary group went down to Berea, Guess uh, they, they followed along and just like the enemy he says, we need to put a stop to this Paul. We need to get rid of him. And so they went and they caused, and they caused a riot in, in, in Berea as well. And they, and they wanted to stop Paul and get rid of him. The spokesman for Jesus. Again, the believers in Berea got a hold of Paul and they said, Paul, it's, you know, for your safety, we need, to, we need to send you out. And so we see Paul leaving Berea. But he left Timothy and he left Silas and he left Luke and he left them in Berea. Why? It's because they probably weren't as bold and confident as what Paul was. Paul was a spokesman and he was bold in his understanding of the gospel. You see, there will always be those that will respond positively to the gospel and there will always be those who will negatively respond to the gospel. And even those who in Thessalonica weren't open to the gospel, yet there were still some that did find Jesus. Some Greeks and some prominent women became followers of Jesus. And in Berea the same. There were some that came and became followers of Jesus. And while the Thessalonians had to be persuaded to follow the Lord, the Bereans came and were open to the gospel. They weren't closed. It, and that kind of speaks to us of two kinds of people that we encounter when we share the gospel. Those whose minds are closed and those who will engage us and listen and, and perhaps then surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God shared in confidence and power can persuade both closed minds 
and open minds. Because it is the power of God that comes and touches lives. You know what? I have never, ever saved a person. But I know Jesus has, and he's used me in the process. But it's only Jesus who saves people. And that's what we need to understand, that Christ comes and shares, and he is the one. The Holy Spirit used the word of God through the Apostle Paul in bringing about salvation, both to the Thessalonians and to the Bereans. God used him, and he raised up men and women in those places. The typical of the enemy's ploy is to try again and again and again and again. He's relentless. We see this from Paul's first missionary journey. We see this now in Paul's secondary, uh, second missionary journey. How the enemy is just relentless. He doesn't give up. He just wants to stop and quench the gospel from going out. He doesn't want you to be in the Word of God. He, he'll, he'll cause all sorts of distractions. You'll just pick up the Bible and the phone will ring. Or you'll just open up the Bible and, and your wife will call you, or husband will call you, or your child will call you. There's always, he, or the dog will do something. And, and it's all these distractions and, and it just happens time and time again. What you need to do is like, go like Susanna Wesley who had all these kids. She would take a blanket and put it over her head and spend her time in the Bible. And when the blanket was over her head and she would read the Bible, the kids knew not to disturb mom. Tell your kids, listen, when my door's shut or you hear me praying, don't come and interrupt. I'm busy with my relationship with Jesus Christ. It's important. Let your kids see your love that you have for Jesus. It's so, so important to be the example. The enemy still tries to silence the message of hope and salvation. Look what it says in the 17th chapter, verse 13. But when the Jews in Thessalonica heard that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. It's just like the enemy, just like, he's like, agitate the crowds. So the gospel wouldn't go forth. But the gospel did go forth, and people did get saved. Luke doesn't describe for us exactly what happened there, but Paul left. The believers got a hold of him and said, Paul, we need to scoot you out of here. Maybe for his own protection. We don't know exactly. But we find him and he goes and he makes his way to Athens. And apparently the Christians in Berea believed that it wasn't a safe place anymore for him in Macedonia. And not in Thessalonica or Berea. And Silas and Peter, they stayed behind. And, but they later on didn't just stay there, but they found Paul. And they later on joined him back in Athens. And they, they continued and they, they met Paul. And then later on we see them meeting Paul again in, in Corinth. His friends, they were always together sharing the gospel. You know, it's so important to, in the message here is that we need people. We need one another to come and encourage one another. To stand beside one another. To spur one another on for good things. To be in the Word of God. We have no record of Paul complaining. Nowhere do in the scriptures do we find Paul complaining to God and say, Oh, here yeah, it's happening again, Lord. What is wrong? You know, I'm doing your work. And now, look, why are you allowing these things to happen? He just accepted it, that this is part and parcel. Didn't Jesus say, In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world? So he's given us a heads up. And so when it happens, don't be surprised. It seems that wherever the gospel went, things were shaken up. Wherever you present the gospel, things will be shaken up. Things will change. Things, people get riled up or people accept the Lord. Some people got saved and some people really got upset at the servants of the Lord. Paul and Silas and Timothy could only do and continue the message of the gospel as they had the confidence, as they knew the Word of God. Remember how we found out how Timothy grew up under, with, with the influence of his godly grandmother and, and, and his mother who, who feared the Lord and, and were in the Word of God. So he knew the Word of God. He knew the Word of God and he and spent time in the Word of God. They were courageous. They were ready and prepared. Whether the storms of persecution and rejection or, or all for the sake of the gospel, would come across their path or not, they always were ready to share the gospel in, in being really courageous about it. They knew that God loved humanity and Jesus Christ loved humanity so much so that Jesus gave his life. They knew that. And the love that they had for people, they didn't want to see people go to a lost eternity. And folks, that should be the burning desire in our lives as well, that we would want no one to go to a lost eternity, no matter how bad they are. Our heart's desire is that they find Jesus and that they surrender their lives to Him and follow Him. 
They relied and trusted in the power of the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and change the lives of those who they shared the Word of God with. Trust God. Go out and tell people. Tell people. Invite people. Invite people to come to church. Invite them to come to men's group. Invite them to come to Bible study so we can be in the Word, into fellowship, that we grow in our understanding of the Lord. May you and I have that same confidence in the Word of God as did Paul, as did Peter, as did Silas, as did Luke, that we can go and share the Word of God with confidence in our lives. May we depend upon and rely upon the Holy Spirit as they did and and be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Remember that the writer of Hebrews, remember, and I want to go back to that scripture this morning, what did the, the writer of Hebrews say about the Word of God? And I want you to understand that we must be plugged into the power of God's Word. If you're not plugged in, time to get plugged in and let the Spirit of God take His Word and bring to remembrance everything that Jesus has said and that you can use the Word of God as a sword. You know, Ephesians says that the Word of God is the sword and and we can wield and that's how we fight off the enemy. We can do combat with the Word of God. And again, for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Look how powerful the Word of God is. How can we not take the Word of God and apply it in our lives? We find ourselves weak and, and, and feeble and, and timid and, 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 and afraid. It's maybe because we're not taking the Word of God and really believing what the, word or what, what the writer of Hebrews said that the Word of God is. Folks, let's get into the Word of God. Spend time in the Word of God. Spend time in the presence of God. Spend time and let the Holy Spirit fill your life and our lives together as a community of faith. And I believe if we take this Word of God and we really apply it and we take it seriously, there'll be remarkable changes that occur in your life. I just want to mention yesterday,